you, Andrew. Okay, so as they're doing that, um, you guys can turn in your Bibles to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. And uh, I'm even more certain than I was before when I put this together days ago that this is the message for today. Psalm 69, verse 2. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Uh, we pray that thy word speaks to our hearts, Lord. Uh, the only thing, Father, that really comforts our hearts, Lord. All those who are out there, wherever they may be, uh, that you may speak to them this, this truth, Lord, not just nice, uh, hopeful thoughts, but facts, what we need to know. I pray you give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond, Lord. And if not, Lord, take it right here to my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title for this morning is The Floods Overflow Me. And it's going to be a special message as we break from, uh, just for one week, uh, from the what the heck is going on uh, series that I'm doing. But before we get to what we're going to do uh, this morning, I don't know if anybody had a chance to read God is Faithful this morning. And uh, uh, this is a book I highly recommend by David Wilkinson called God is Faithful, written probably, I, I think he put this together like 2011, but uh, it's my favorite devotional. I read it just about every day, and it's it's no candy canes and lollipops. It's the real deal of life. And for today, January 30th, 2022, look what it says. God has everything under control. The whole world is trembling right now over the outbreak of terror and calamities throughout the earth. Every day we wake up to learn of another disaster. Non-believers are becoming convinced there are no solutions left, that everything is spinning into chaos. But God's people know differently. We know there is no reason to fear because the Bible repeatedly reminds us that the Lord has everything under control. The psalmist writes, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nation, Psalm 22, 28. Likewise, the prophet Isaiah declares to the world, come near you nations to hear and heed you people. Isaiah 34, 1, he is saying, listen, nations, I want to tell you something, something important about the creator of the world. Isaiah states that when God's indignation is aroused against nations, it is the Lord himself who delivers them to slaughter. Isaiah 40, verses 15, 17, and 22, and 25. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are counted as the small dust of the scales, on the scales. All nations before him, before God, are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. God knew. The earth was round, Isaiah knew. To whom then will you liken me, God asking. Isaiah then speaks to God's people who are troubled by world events. Look up to the glorious sky and behold the millions of stars. Your God created and named every one. Are you not more precious to him than they? Therefore, fear not. Our Father knows the end from the beginning. Let us ask ourselves, where is the Lord's eye focus? Where does God's eye focus? Certainly not on the world's tin God dictators or their threats. I like that. The world's tin God, lowercase g, dictators or their threats. Scripture assures us these wild men's bombs, armies, and powers are as nothing to the Lord. He laughs at them as mere specks of dust, and soon he will blow them all away. God is on the case, and he's not impressed by the people that we fear so much who are in control. Is anybody really in control? No, they think they are. But let's get to uh, what I want to talk about this morning. The floods, the floods overflow me. Anyway, like I said, I wanted to take a break from uh, the What the Heck is Going On series, and we'll get back to that next week. Uh, but for today... 
I really felt compelled and I really thought of this message Monday. I believe we all need a word of hope and encouragement at times, right? Uh, I can teach about world events and doctrines and all those things, but we still need a word of encouragement, a word of hope. So we can go from the fires of despair and discouragement and depression, go and enter into the warm waters of God's peace. I'm going to coin that term, the warm waters of God's peace, meaning no matter what is out there, no matter what's going on, whatever the news is, God's word stands alone as the answer and as the peace. Anyway, I'm going to explain to you, and you know, guys, I tell you the truth probably to a fault. Some people say, you know, you probably shouldn't be so honest with people and tell them about all your weaknesses and sins, but I can't stop. It's it's, it's who I am. Uh, in case you don't know, Mondays for pastors, uh, if, if you take, uh, if you're a pastor, and most pastors take off Monday, it's my technical day off. And believe it or not, Mondays are the hardest days for me. I dread them. Because I'm usually on a high on a Sunday after church, and I get very down on Mondays, and I usually struggle, and it's a it's a hard day for me. So Monday was, you know, like a typical Monday for me, but it was very very hard. Matter of fact, that it was worse than a typical Monday. It was a very extraordinarily hard Monday, and I, I do what I do is I get alone and I take a long drive and. Uh, I drove all the way out to Southampton, New York, and then all the way to uh, Lindenhurst <laughs> on some ways. I was just driving. And I was alone in prayer, looking for a word from God. Yet, I didn't get anything for the whole day. It's funny, whenever I come home from my prayer drive, my wife says, so how is it? Did you, did you, did you hear anything from God? And normally I come back up powered, recharged, excited, and I said, nothing. And I was in a real bad mood. I said, I prayed, I agonized, poured out my heart, and I got nothing. And I was very angry. I was angry because I was beginning to feel overwhelmed by all that's going on. And yeah, people, I get overwhelmed too by what's going on. And I went to pray and see God and I went to God with this complaint. And it's not, um, it's not impossible to go to play, complain to God. David, David did it. Elijah did it. I mean, so many people of God complained to God. And I said to the Lord in my prayer drive, I, I said, Lord, it is just becoming too hard for me. This pain of living and serving all the time. How can I keep everyone up and excited about you? It's too much to bear. And I'm tired and I'm overwhelmed. And in that agony, and if you've, if you've ever watched the clip, I'll maybe show it to you guys again. It's like a little 10 minute clip from David Wilkinson, A Call to Anguish. If you haven't seen that, then you can watch that every day. And, he's, and he says, if you haven't anguished over something, you haven't gotten anywhere. Anguish over God. You need to anguish over the state of our world. You need to anguish over where you are in your life. And you need to anguish over your relationship with God. And I anguished. And when I began to anguish over God over the next couple of days, he began to show me something that I was. He was showing me that. As I complained about it, it's just too much. I'm overwhelmed by this. It's too much to comprehend. And it is. I mean, the news is just, it's too much to comprehend. It is just overwhelming. And like, you know, you hear something, you go, you got to be kidding me. This is incredible. But then God reminded me, no, you need to be overwhelmed by something else. Okay? You're overwhelmed by the wrong thing. You need to be overwhelmed by how much I love you and how much I am involved in every little detail of your life. I know every single little 
nuance of your existence, every tear, everything. And he brought it to me in such a way that it was just overwhelming. And instead of being overwhelmed with the floods of the problems and the issues and, and, uh, and people, please don't stop calling me for advice and comfort. I, that's, it's actually what's keeping me alive and moving is knowing that people need to hear comfort and truth. The enemy wants me to say, I got no more hope for you guys. I got no more truth, but I turn to God and God turns to me. And he brought me three Psalms, which we're going to go over today. Psalm 69, 1 through 5, Psalm 139, 1 through 20. And David's conclusion to these pains, I believe, is found in Psalm 23. But anyway, with all that said, I have no other notes prepared. I am not going, I didn't prepare anything. I just said, let's just see where the Holy Spirit takes us today. And I had no idea what kind of a day it was going to be with the big blizzard and church, you know, partially opened and stressing out about, because I stress out. I'm like so angry that I couldn't plow and out there, you know, working on pulling hubs apart and the wind and everything, getting really angry, saying, God, I'm doing this all for you. But God had something today. And he has, as he always does, restores my joy. But you know what's interesting? You know what he showed me, and we're going to talk about it, is he restored my joy not by the good news that I heard. Because that okay, God, you know what? Let the plow, I, I must have prayed over our plow truck 10 times. I had multiple people praying over it. Like that would be a good news or the storm not coming or something better about the government or something. To, you know what? Just bad news. God says you're looking for good feelings. You're looking at to find hope by what you hear and see out there. What if there won't be any answer out there? Then your hope is in things that might not happen. You have to hope only in me. And he brought me to Psalm 69. And let's go to Psalm 69 verses 1 through 5. Psalm 69 verse 1. To the chief musician upon Shoshanahim, a psalm of David. Save me, O Lord, for the waters are come up unto my soul. I sink deep in mire where there is no standing. I come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My now when I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness. My sins are not hid from thee. So David here, he's doing a lot of things. Uh, number one, he's being honest. He goes, you know, I can't stand alone anymore. I'm getting drowned. I am overwhelmed. It's not like the water is up to my neck. The water is over my head. I can't live when the water is over my head. You can't. And he's weary and he's trying and he's tired of talking and praying. Many days, uh, I can ask my wife, I, you know, I constantly have a sore throat and always, oh, man, maybe I'm sick, you know, but it's not sick it's just because I talk all day and, and I'll be on the phone talking to people all day or uh, just trying to uplift counsel, answer questions. And you know what? My, my throat has nothing else to give. And I know how David feels. But David also knows it's foolishness to think this way. He goes, I know I'm afraid. I know I've had it. I know I'm overwhelmed. I know I'm tired. And I know I'm complaining. And I know it's foolishness to be complaining. Because you know me, Lord. You know my up sittings and my down sittings, and you know my sins. So Psalm 69 is, is really how I felt on Monday. I really did. 
But again, God restored me, and not with good news, but his good news, not with world good news. And I know I'm repetitive, but I know every week, and I know every day, if you guys are like me, you're looking for every morsel of possible, anything good on the horizon coming. Okay, and when we see a couple of good things, a couple of things politically happening that sound pretty good, we're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to hold on to this. And then the next day, something goes that counteracts that, oh, man, it's all lost. And it's tiring. And God keeps saying, stop looking for your hope in the hope of man. Look for your hope where there is truth and there is no turning from it. It is a positive promise. And that's where I began to tear deep into my soul. And where God, you know, people, uh, I've been posting a lot of quotes by Rich Mullins on uh, social media. And he's a Christian musician, passed away uh, years ago. And uh, a lot of people didn't like what Rich had to say. Matter of fact, he would say, a lot of people don't like how I like God. And uh, he got called heretics, but he would say some bold things. And I put, and I would post a lot of his words. And one of the ones, and I'm just going to, this is a real bad misquote, but he said in so many words, when you come to God, he has to tear you to shreds. Rip your soul apart, lay it open where bugs and maggots are tearing at it. And you wonder, God, this is tormenting but until you get to that place you've never felt god you've never been there and some say it's too painful to get there but you can't get there without the pain this is where god speaks and this is what he spoke to me of his deep deep concern okay and people say well how does god speak to you pastor well, you know not in an audible voice but in an inner silent voice, which is so loud, you can't mistake it. You just know what it is, especially when you're praying for something and you're, you know, you're looking for the answer to be this. But God says, I'm going to answer you in a still small voice. And he answered me in such an extravagant, wonderful way in Psalm 139. So let's go to Psalm 139. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. Psalm 139. This is really a powerful psalm, and you really should, you know, mark it in your Bibles and read it often. When you feel alone, when you feel beaten, when you feel, does God really care about my little life and my little family and my little hangnail and my little cane and my little concern? Does he really? Because I people, if we don't believe that, we're going to be in a lot of despair because we're going to feel alone. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to feel alone, abandoned by God, forgotten by God. And he whispers in our ears, you are so insignificant. He doesn't care about you. When are you going to get it through your head that you're nothing to him? You're pawns in his game. That's what Satan says. And we begin to believe that. But listen to what the psalmist knows of God. Look at Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or I stand up. You know my every thought went far away. So let's pause there for a second. God knows every now i always say that's a good thing and a bad thing it it can be bad because he knows everything that i think and that's not always good things on our wednesday night bible study this present darkness visible that we're in this series i talk about uh you know the enemy's uh you know ploy to bring us up to these thoughts of of what we really are and we begin to become frightened but 
God knows our hearts. And despite him knowing our hearts, he still loves our hearts. That's the point. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down and you know when I stand up. Now, we can just think about upon that mathematically. Okay, How many times have you gotten up and sat down in your entire life? Many times. Okay? Many times. Thousands. I remember when I used to teach at my old job, it was a vocational school, and I would I'd tell people uh, how to operate equipment. And uh, they have these reports. We, we know that they say every time when you're in a piece of heavy equipment, like a bulldozer or a backhoe or a loader, uh, you look behind you and forward a thousand times a day. Okay, you're looking forward, looking back, looking forward, looking back. That's why usually heavy equipment operators have bed necks and spines by the time they retire. And how up and sit down? God says, I have. If, you know, God has this massive computer mind that if you say, oh, you're God, really? Well, how many times? Instantly, he would know. Okay? I know exactly how many times. The Bible says every one of our tears are counted in a bottle. Every single tear you've ever cried. God, you want to know how many times you cried? I have the amount of tears bottle. I can immediately recall them. Just yours. You know, when I sit down or stand up, you know, my every thought when afar off, when I am so far. Isn't that a funny thing? We always think that when we're far from God, God is far from us, but he's not. How many of us have gone through those times where you feel like, oh, I'm so far from God. He is so far from me. I'm just such in a bad place. I don't want to come to church anymore. I've been away. I don't want to come back. We might feel like we're far from God, but he's never far from us. If you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, he is with you for better, for worse, whether you like it or not, every single minute minute of the day. Check out verse three. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. Talk about a GPS, a global positioning system. God knows. Isn't that you know incredible? I always I know when the GPS things first came out, then we used to have them like little portable things, a little suction cup, a Garmin, whatever. You put it on there and it would tell you exactly where I was like, wow. And then when I was driving, it would tell me how fast I was going by satellites and I'm like that's incredible well how about this how about god's positioning system he knows exactly where you are i i talk to a lot of the moms i know we have one for my son luke you know now you can track your kids you know exactly where they are by their cell phones right and we've shared some funny stories i remember uh Rich's wife, Tammy, shared the story about thinking her son was in the middle of a lake <laughs> because of where the signal was. It was freezing a lake. Oh, my God. <laughs> but this is incredible. And, then, and verse 3 really tells us multiple things. And this is not just, you know, hope for Gia. It would be nice if God. No, this is God. This is what God actually does. First of all, you chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. We might think we're in control of everything. God is in control of everything. He sees the paths that we take and he tells us where to go. He might tell us to get off at exit 62 and we get off at exit 63, but we end up back, you know, at the end of the day, back where we're supposed to be, exit 62, right? It's like, the GPS again, you know, if you miss the exit, you know, mine always has like an attitude voice, recalculating, you idiot. But I always feel like my GPS is like mad at me. What are you doing? Do a U-turn, you jerk, you know? <laughs> and I always feel bad. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. GPS. <laughs> I'm always, just, I'm, not, I'm afraid everybody's always mad at me. That's me. I'm even upset when my GPS is mad at me. I don't want it mad at me. Isn't that funny? But we're not concerned when God is mad at us, when we didn't listen to where we were supposed to go and what we were supposed to do. We should be more concerned about that. You chart 
the path ahead. And to chart means to, you know, someone who puts together a sailing chart, you know, it's, it's longitude and latitude, you know, calculations. God has these, these deep, detailed plans for your life charted out before the beginning of creation for you and I. And they're very technical. And yet he knows every single one of us. You tell me where to stop. And you tell me where. You know, God wants us to rest sometimes. I mean, most of the time we spend too much time resting. But God does say it's time to rest your soul. Okay. A lot of times we think, okay, well, that's great. I get the thumbs up from God to rest. I'm going to go get, go to a party, get wasted, lay out on the beach. Drunk. No, that's not the resting he's talking about. You need to rest in me. Get alone with me. And sometimes, and I've, I've learned in my prayer drives and my time alone with God, I spend so much time whining and talking to God. I spend very little time listening to what he's trying to tell me. He's like, okay, you know, just, I'm not, and, and that's what I felt like happened on Monday. It's like, okay, just keep on. I'm not going to say anything because you won't shut up. Okay. When you finally shut up and let me talk, because God won't talk over us. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. Wow. Verse 4, you know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. That's scary. But that's powerful. No one knows that. Not the greatest scientist, doctor, whoever they are, no one. The Greatest minds, even Elon Musk doesn't know that, okay? It's become, it's interesting that, and I have nothing against the guy. I think he's pretty cool, and I think he's coming a long way, but, you know, he's like the richest guy in the world, and he's probably one of the smartest guys in the world. I don't know if you guys saw, he was on a Christian show, and they were asking him about God and salvation, and he's contemplating, he's thinking, you know, like an, like an agnostic, very good. He's interested because he's smart and he knows. I'm going to think about this because I, I think he was on the Babylon Bee, the talk show. A lot of times it's satire, but they had him on as a guest, Elon Musk, and they were asking him, what do you think about Jesus Christ? And about, you know, and he was pondering and not dismissing, but thinking because he's smart. Okay. You know where I'm going. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. So God is even smarter than Elon Musk. Okay? He's richer than Elon Musk. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Money is no problem for God. Look at verse 5. This is an interesting scripture. You both proceed and follow me. Okay? And you would think... That they're the same thing, because if God proceeds, well, they're not really, because if God precedes me, he goes before me, okay, and he also follows me. How does he do that? How can you be in front of me and in back of me at the same time? Because he's God, okay? Sometimes God, well, God is always leading us. But he's like looking back and come on this way here. And you're not following him, you know. And then when we don't follow him, he follows us. When we walk into dark pathways that we shouldn't go. Do you know we bring God with us into those places? I'm just going to run and go into this dark place. God says, okay, I'm coming with you. Don't think you're going to have a good time if I'm with you. Okay. One of the frustrating things about being a believer and you learn is I was talking the other day, we were talking about this, about running from God. And, you know, I'm sore as a believer. I've had these times, you know, years ago, I said, you know, what would happen if I went back to my old life? I just, I'm not going to do this Christian thing anymore. I'm not going to go back. And I, you know, in my early years as a Christian, I pondered that. And I realized, kind of like Solomon, as I pondered these things, it's impossible. Because, hey, what if I think I'm, I'm going to go to a bar, I'm going to go to a strip club, I'm going to go hang out with a bunch of people, and I'm not going to feel, I'm going to, this is great. No. Once Christ is with you, he's with you forever. You can't shake him off your tail. Okay? He's the greatest tailor. He follows you. Okay? 
and he comes with you, you would be miserable and you would say, and we're going to talk about it, you know, in, in these scriptures that wherever I go, you're with me, whether I like it or not. You can't go back, people. You can try, many have, and you want to see a miserable Christian? You see a, a Christian who has turned this back on God, was truly saved, and tries to go back to their old life. You don't even have the joy of getting drunk, okay, or getting high, or doing bad things. God takes it all away and just makes it a miserable existence for you. You both proceed and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Isn't there, isn't there something that God is always laying his hand of blessing upon us, even when we don't deserve it? It's God's grace. How many times have we done things or gone places that we shouldn't be and God is still there to protect us. I've shared before, I look back in my life, even before I was a believer, and all the places and things that I've done, that I should have ended up in jail, I should have been dead, I should have been in a lot of problems, but even then, God was watching over. In my sins, God is watching over. Well, I mean, well, how can we liken that in, in, in our minds? Well, as a parent, you know, if you, you know, if you ever had to pick up your kid at the police station or whatever, they've gone through something bad. Do you ever, you know, pick them up and, and hate them? No. You love them and you say, come on, let's go home. And you're upset. You're disappointed. But you love them. And if they say, mom, I'm hungry. They didn't feed me anything in jail. What's mom and dad going to do? Going to feed them. Will God not do anything less for us? Now, that isn't a license just to go out and say, well, whatever I do, God will bless me. No, he'll protect you, he'll guide you, but he's certainly not going to give you a smiling type of favor, but a more of a protective favor. Verse 6, the psalmist says, as he ponders what he just said from verse 1, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too great for me to know. And that's what I was feeling the other day. When I was feeling overwhelmed by the world, God says, no, I want you to be overwhelmed by me. Well, what do you mean, God? Be overwhelmed by how much I love you, how much I am concerned just about you. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying here. God, I think upon what you said about you know my up you know when I get up when I sit down anywhere I go you're before me you after me every hair of my head every tear everything I can't comprehend it God says think upon that if you're going to be overwhelmed by anything overwhelmed by God's love grace and mercy for you verse seven is that scripture I was uh, leading up to, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. And that's the part about if you say, well, I'm just going to go and do what I want to do. I'm too tired of this God thing. God says, go do it. But guess what? I'm going to be there too. You want to watch that on TV? I'm sitting there right now. Let's watch it together. Well, that's no fun. It's like sometimes we're like, God, just can you just like, leave me alone? God says, can't. I won't. I never will. I love you too much. So if you want to go do that, I'll sit there and fight with you. And what does that do when we start to begin to feel that? I say, well, I don't want to do that anymore. Because the joy, and we can be angry, the joy is gone. God says, yeah, I'm glad the joy is gone. I don't want you to find joy there. I want you to find joy with me. And I'm going to be with you everywhere you go. We're going to hunt you down the rest of your life. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Amen to that. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you're there. And if we notice, we see the psalmist kind of a little bit of an attitude. He's not happy about it. You would think it's a positive thing. He's kind of, I can't run from you. But it's a good thing. I can't even when I want to. 
If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Did you ever go on vacation? You know, I'm sure you have. When I used to go on vacations, I used to think, gee, I wonder, you know, when I'm on vacation as a Christian, do I get to like not be a Christian anymore? Is it like, oh, you're on vacation, just let it go. Do whatever you want to do. You're off, you know, you're, no, you're off the clock, so have a good time. Come back. And sometimes people, you know, God says, I am everywhere you go. I remember there's a, there's a true story. You can ask my wife. I remember we went to Virginia one year for vacation. And it's, you know, people don't make these things up. I was thinking upon this. And because I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm like that statue of the guy sitting thinking. I'm always thinking, and I was thinking about, gee, God, I'm so far on vacation. If I did something like wrong, like, would you really know? Because I'm like, like God's like, he can't make it to Virginia or something. <laughs> so as I'm thinking upon that, I'm all the way in Virginia, and who pulls in besides me to get gas behind me is somebody from my church. I'm like, what are you guys? Oh, we want vacation. This is crazy. How do we meet here? And what did God say? <laughs> Everywhere you go, I am. I never said that. People, that's a true story. You can't hide, but that's good. But that's good. Verse ten. Even there, your hand. Well, let's go to verse nine. If I if I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans. Riding on the wings of the morning is that taking off feeling, I believe. It's it's like I'm escaping. I am getting, how many people have said it lately? I've said it. That's, I'm getting on a plane or a truck or whatever, and I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go to where it's better. Everyone's going to somewhere that's better. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times in the last two years. That's it. I'm getting out of here. Pack it up. Going to better, you know, where are you going? I'm going to this nirvana land where none of this can follow me, really. I'll have good luck with that. And God says, if I ride, the psalmist writes, if I ride on the winds of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I shared with you guys when I when I moved to California to take over my first church, it, you know, it, it was to follow the Lord and take over the church, obviously. But there was also a part of me that was excited. I was moving to a new place and I, I had so much baggage back here and so many problems. And I went through that whole depression thing. And I was like, you know what? I really need a new start. This is going to be great. Going to be, I mean, you can't go much further from Long Island to California. It's complete 3,000 miles. I mean, that's far enough from my past, people that I knew and I was so tired of. I'm just getting away. This is going to be great. But you know what? And I've shared it before. You know what happened the day I arrived in California? You know who showed up to? Me. <laughs> I was there too. The same me who was in Long Island is the same me who arrived. And I didn't change by, wow, I'm here. I left old me behind. No, old me follows me wherever I go. And what did God show me? Wherever you go, you got to deal with your fears, your concerns, your weaknesses. They don't go away. You can't hide from them. So if you want to move there, go. Move. But remember, I'm going to be there working on your same issues, your, your same sins and struggles and worries. They're going to be there. And we're going to work on them. Okay? You want to go wherever you want? Fine. No problem. But you won't escape you, and you certainly won't escape God. Verse 11, I could ask the darkness to hide me, and the light around me, too, becomes night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are both light to you. And that's, again, trying to hide in the darkness. Always remember, bad things happen mostly at night. 
You put people in a dark place, they're more prone to do bad things than in a bright place. And I've shared before, before I used to live in the house behind the church, the parsonage, the old pastor never lived back there. So it was always just a vacant house. So we had a lot of problem with vandalism and because everyone knew the church was just empty all week long and there would be kids and parties going on. How do you think we stopped that? Lights. Put big spotlights on and no one wanted to hang out when everyone's watching you. And I remember going, wow, what a profound experiment. Okay, whenever we, it's a funny thing because I have uh, the parking lot lights for the parking lot of the church. They're not hooked up to the church, it's strange. They're hooked up to the parsonage. So I have the switch there. And whatever, like, like a bunch of kids will come up and there's a party going on in the parking lot, it happens. I said, I said, Julie, watch this. Okay, I put the parking lot lights on, the lights come on, and they go. Why? The light exposes the darkness. Oh, no, no, you can see what we're doing. Okay? They always like to park far away back by the dumpster in the darkest place. I like to tease people not to go, hey, how you guys doing? What's going on in there? You want to hear about Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> I've had some fun. I've, I've seen some things. It's interesting. Uh, but God is there, even in the darkness. Verse 13, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You watch, now these verses here, this is one thought, so I'm gonna read them together, but this is e extremely scientific here. What the psalmist is talking about and what God is conveying here. Verse 13 through 16, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. People, what is he talking about? And how would the psalmist or the writer even know about what's going on in the womb? Okay, God knows. And people, if you ever doubt God and you ever have these you know, moments like, oh man, just think about childbirth. I mean, I tell you, I can spend a whole day talking about the forming of a child in the womb. You know, you know what's so sad? It, it happens so often that we take it for granted. But you've really got to sit and understand. God says, do you understand? If, if we just had a, a class on how, you know, a sperm and an egg and how everything is formed and what happens in the womb, you just watch that whole teaching on it even from a secular scientist it's mind-blowing you have two separate people who made one person who's never existed before with a unique fingerprint and a unique dna pattern that never existed they say and one day we're going to show the clip again uh louis biglio uh he has a couple and he does one we're going out to space and he goes one they're going into the body and it's incredible when the baby is being formed, you know, your eyelids are one eyelid. They're just one piece of skin. And doctors can't figure out, it's like a visible hand with a scalpel comes and cuts the eye lid so they become two separate pieces. Who's doing that? How does that happen? The first thing that happens when you conceive, you know, if, if you've ever been there, you, know, you go to the doctor and you wouldn't listen for a little heartbeat. It starts to be by an electrical current. They don't know where does it come from. It's the life of God. And it'll beat until the day you die. Through all your ups and downs, people, we are incredibly made. God says, just look. People, I can, you know, I, to me, I, I can go on about this. You have a little, a little baby, you know, and don't call it a fetus to me. I call it a human, okay, with, with little 
bones and little joints and little tendons. You know, ever see a baby come out? It's got little fingernails, little perfect fingernails, and little skin that scrunches up with, with the knuckles bend. It has veins, heart, everything. But you know what we take for granted? And bones, everything grows in proportion. What happens if the bones grew faster than the skin or the veins? The heart, the brain has to grow in your skull is growing. That's pretty incredible. How is that possible for everything to grow in proper proportion? You know why? Because God said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you. What does it mean to take two things and intertwine them and make one out of them? That's incredible. Verse 17. Well, let's just, let's go over verse 16 again. You knew me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. God, had, God keeps books. The book of Revelation tells us about that. Okay. You better make sure you're in the Lamb's book of life. Okay. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God knows exactly before you're born, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, what's going to happen, the day you're going to die, every experience, every person you're going to run into, everything you're going to embrace, everything. It's all pre-known by God. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts about me? Oh, God. They are innumerable. I can't even stop thinking. I am so overwhelmed by you, God. I should not be overwhelmed by what's happening outside this world. Verse 18, I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up in the morning, you're still with me. No matter what you did Saturday night, you wake up Sunday morning, God's still with you, whether you like it or not, as a believer. But let's get to the conclusion as we run out of time here. What was the conclusion that David had to make as he thought about the highs, the lows, the good days, the bad days, uh, when he was complaining and moaning and crying and weeping and this life was just horrible at times? Well, he thought upon what God told him about who he was and how much. David, how much? I think about you all the time. And that means every single one of you, those who know Christ and those who don't know Christ. And David concludes and which, and God drew me to this scripture. It was like this masterful plan. God gave me Psalm 69, Psalm 139. And then, then he goes, now I want you to read Psalm 23, Scott. And you know what Psalm 23 is, but let's just read it again. And I want to read it in the New Living Translation because we've all read it a million times in the King James. Psalm 23. So this is our conclusion. Whatever you are facing today, when the floods are overflowing you, no matter where you are, and I know it's so hard when you're at the hospital, when you're at the ER, when things are not going well, when you're sad and you're depressed, you've lost a loved one. The word of God remains. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. God is constantly renewing that which was replenished the day before. I needed to be renewed and replenished. He guides me along right paths. God never said, you know, laughs and says, <laughs> I'm going to set him down that road. He's going to be all messed up. He never does that. He guides me along right paths. And you know what? A guide doesn't make you do things, okay? God is saying, go that way by the neck and drag us there. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. You know how you know you're in the right path with God? Because wherever you are, God is being glorified. If you ever end up in a place where you have to keep your God thing to yourself and God becomes less important, you're in the wrong place. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, which we've learned, people, is every day. Every day, 
we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And David says, this is what I've learned. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely, meaning without a doubt, every single day, no matter what I must go through or see or be, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Interesting, God has to chase us with it. As I can imagine that, I got my love and blessing. Just stop running away from it. Like, no, God, I don't want it. No, you need it. I don't want it. I want my stuff. No, this my stuff is better. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. People, God is pursuing you. Let him catch you. Right? Just say, uncle, I cry uncle, and fall down. Say, God, here I am, just consume me. And I will. And this is the, the, this is the big end game that we fear, that we should be excited about. At the end of the day, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. While I'm here, you're with me. And when I die, I'm going to be with you forever. And I cannot lose. So... That's what I learned last Monday. I hope that helped you this morning. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer, and then we'll close with a song. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you pursue us, that you are not a God who loves us from a distance. You are a God, a creator, who is very concerned with every little nuance of our existence, every thought, every fear, wherever we are, wherever we're going through, you are there and you are continually drawing us to you. We can either fight that and run from it or we can just say, Lord, I cannot fight you anymore. And I certainly cannot fight this world and this discouragement. I need to just fall down and say, Lord, come and indwell me as I am, where I am, and take me where you want me to be because that's the only peace and joy in this world. And I don't have to look at the world to get joy and peace. Things may, though may, there might be good days, bad days, but at the end of the day, they're fluid. They don't stay consistent. The only good news that stays consistent is your good news and love towards me. Father, I pray that everyone listening here knows you as Lord and Savior, and they bow the knee and just cry out and say, God in heaven, I'm not sure if I understand all this, but I know I need forgiveness. I know I need you. And I want to know you, Lord, this God, this creator, who has been following on me all the days of my life. I want you. I confess my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again the third day. And also you can have me to yourself because you love me so. I want that. Here I am. Show me the way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to close with the song. <clears throat>